Good morning everyone and a very very warm welcome to our service this morning for Passion Sunday from St Andrews with Castlegate United Reformed Church and thank you very much indeed for joining us. As you will see this morning we are not in church, we're making individual recordings and our profound thanks to Graham who has done an incredible amount of hard work in putting these recordings together to make a coherent act of worship. The order of service for today has been sent to you. Please do join in in those parts that are in bold type. Let us worship God together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness, or danger, or the sword. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We sing together our first hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God my Father. Come before our God in a time of prayer and reflection. Let us pray. 
Eternal God, on this Passion Sunday, we celebrate the astonishing truth that lies at the heart of Holy Week. The fact that Jesus endured the humiliation of Gethsemane, the agony of the cross, and the darkness of the tomb. Not because he had to, but because he chose to. Jesus gave his life so that we might find life. He was broken so that we might be made whole. We celebrate that from the beginning of his ministry, Jesus knew the end it would lead to, the cost involved, and yet he continued undeterred. He refused to be deflected from his chosen path, choosing the way of humility, service and self-sacrifice, the lonely path of the cross. Jesus gave his life so that we might find life. He was broken so that we might be made whole. Eternal God, however often we hear the story, we never fail to be amazed by the magnitude of your love. We deserve so little, yet you give so much. We serve you so poorly, yet your grace is so rich. So we come in thanksgiving and celebration to offer you our heartfelt worship and to commit ourselves again to your service. Jesus gave his life so that we might find life. He was broken so that we might be made whole. Please receive our heartfelt praise. We say together the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Mark is now going to read for us from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. This morning's Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, reading from verse 1 to 14, the Valley of Dry Bones. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me to and fro among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, say to it this is what the Sovereign Lord says. 
Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life, and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Mark. We sing together, From heaven you came, helpless babe, entered our world, your glory veiled. At this point in our service, our young friends would normally leave for their own separate services and we would say a blessing for them and for their leaders. 
But because we are not together physically, there's no earthly reason why we still shouldn't say a blessing for our young friends. And so we pray together. Almighty and eternal God, we ask your blessing on our young friends wherever they are. Some required to stay at home, separated from their friends and anxious about the future. We pray that you will give them hope, inner peace and the profound knowledge that they are loved and cared for. Please keep them safe and wrap your blessing around them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. We shall now hear a reading from John chapter 11, verses 32 to 44, and Anne is going to read for us. Our second reading today is taken from John 11, reading from verses 32 to 44. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much indeed, Anne. By the end of the 7th century BC, the people of Israel had totally transformed the land of Canaan and of course the capital city, Jerusalem. They had created a fortress, impregnable, defended by high walls with cleverly designed zigzag gateways that no one could just ride or march through. At the centre of this fortress stood their towering achievement, the Temple to Yahweh, containing the Holy of Holies and within this the most sacred of their religious artefacts, the Ark of the Covenant containing the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. Life was good, and they were proud of their conquest and their achievements. And then the unthinkable happened. Under the leadership of King Nebuchadrezzar, the Babylonian Empire attacked. In 587 BC, Jerusalem was stormed and destroyed. The temple was burned down, the ark was stolen to be lost forever, and the Judean king and his family brutally murdered. The people fled for their lives, and many ended up in exile in Babylon. 
This is the situation in which Ezekiel exercises his prophetic gift and has his visions. Ezekiel was a priest in the temple, who when the temple was destroyed fled with his people to Babylon. He then over many years journeyed backwards and forwards between Jerusalem and Babylon, acting as a go-between for the people in exile and those still trapped in Jerusalem. His book falls into the category of apocalyptic literature. Just like the books of Daniel and Revelation, it records a prophet's visions. These visions are then written down in code, so that should the manuscript fall into the wrong hands, the person carrying it would not be killed as a traitor or a revolutionary. Now this presents us today with an enormous problem because we do not know the code. The best we can do is to try to interpret what we think the prophet means, what we think the prophet is trying to say to his people by way of encouragement. Which brings us to the Valley of Dry Bones. Through this very uncomfortable story, Ezekiel is actually offering his fellow exiles a word of comfort. He sees very clearly the total ruin to which Israel has been reduced. And he offers encouragement to them by sharing that under such conditions, the only basis for hope lies in the healing power of God, who is calling the lost to a new and more meaningful relationship with him. The Valley of Dry Bones does not represent dead Israelites. It represents the destroyed house of Israel. Ezekiel, through his vision, gives new hope to the exiles that God will rebuild their community. Out of what is dead, God will bring new life. And indeed, only God can do that. The desperation that the exiles are feeling can be countered and overcome when that is confronted with the Lord of life in all his love and compassion. Ezekiel's rather disturbing vision is actually a call to hope, profound realistic hope, that the new life which the people seek is indeed possible and attainable with God. In fact nearly all of the books that we now call the Old Testament were written in the exile, and after the people of Israel returned from exile, and many of them were written as polemic against those Babylonian gods. In spite of a less than enthusiastic response, the words of Ezekiel, Jeremiah and Isaiah, to name just three, clearly resonated for a nation looking for a new start. We too live in a time when hope is profoundly needed, and we long for a new beginning, a new possibility for community, a new possibility for sharing. And we will look at that in just a moment. For now we sing together the hymn, I cannot tell why he whom angels worship should set his love upon the human race.
Whatever you believe about the story of the raising of Lazarus from the dead, and there are many ways of looking at that story, it is a story about Jesus bringing new life into a situation that others thought contained only death. Jesus does that all the time. He brings hope to the hopeless. He brings touch and affection to those that nobody else wants to touch. He brings love to the unloved and the unlovable. He brings purpose to those who are simply drifting aimlessly through life. We can see from our Gospel stories that Jesus is so often the catalyst that brings new life into a situation that seemed hopeless. That must be because he believed in a God who can and does make all things new. The kingdom of which Jesus preached so often was and is a kingdom where death is transformed into resurrection life. It was and is a kingdom where the possibility of new life is always being held out as an attainable reality. And it is not a kingdom of the future. It is a kingdom of the here and now. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Today is Passion Sunday when we are reminded as if we needed to be that suffering is a very real and a very painful part of the human condition. The valley of dry bones is everywhere and we don't need to look too far to find representations of it. The challenge offered by Passion Sunday is to live through and to transform suffering, and not to be overcome or embittered by it. The challenge is to find the real potential of new life for ourselves and for others. We are kingdom people, and the kingdom to which we belong is a resurrection kingdom, with a God who is always making all things new. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Dry bones can live and breathe again. God will always transform what feels terrible and overwhelming into new life and new purpose. We come before our God in a time of prayer and reflection. Let us pray together. Almighty and eternal God, all the many blessings of this life come from you. We give you our heartfelt thanks for all that you have shared and continue to share with us. We offer our gifts, ourselves, all that we are and all that we have to be used in the furthering of your kingdom across your world. Almighty and eternal God, we pray week in and week out that your kingdom will come and your will be done. It's easy to say those words. It is far harder to mean them, for they are concerned not just with you, but also with us. Help us to understand that your kingdom is not just in the future, but something that begins within us, here and now. 
Help us then to recognize our role in bringing your kingdom nearer through the love we show, the care we display, and the service we offer. May your kingdom come and your will be done. Eternal God, we pray for our world and for an end to all that frustrates your purposes. We think of those in countries wracked by conflict, famine, disease and poverty. We think of those who face repression and discrimination, persecuted for what they believe or for who they are. We think of all those who are the victims of crime, violence and war. May your kingdom come and your will be done. Eternal God, we pray for all those who work hard to build a more just and loving world all who strive to bring help and healing. We pray for aid agencies, pressure groups, charities, churches, so many who in different ways contribute to the fulfilment of your purposes of justice and peace. May your kingdom come and your will be done. We pray for all those we know in need of our prayers, praying especially at this time for those we know to be sick, ill in hospital, face to face with the reality of death, or finding life difficult in our current crisis. And we hold them all before you in the loving silence of our hearts. We share together a time of quiet prayer. Eternal God, we look forward to that day when you will establish justice between the nations and when there will be an end to sorrow, suffering, darkness and death. Help us to commit ourselves fully to your service and to work for your glory, so that we may honestly say and truly mean, may your kingdom come and your will be done. Amen. We sing together the hymn, How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word.
We conclude our worship as we say together the blessing of St. Columba. Be thou a bright flame before me. Be thou a guiding star above me. Be thou a smooth path below me. Be thou a kindly shepherd behind me. Today and forever. Amen.